fundraiser. I'm, I'm never going to be. <laughs> Is it still pretty windy out there? I felt like I was going to get blown out. I took a call out there. I thought I was going to get blown over. It's a warm wind. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's a dry heat. <laughs> Oop, there we go, a couple seconds. Told me to wait a couple seconds and I did not follow instructions. All right, welcome to this public forum with uh, Mr. Ian Galloway from the Federal Reserve. Um, it's great to see so many folks here, absolutely. And uh, this, is, uh, this presentation is presented by the Eastern Oregon Small Business Development Center here at EOU, um, the Eastern Oregon Center for Economic Information at EOU and the EOU College of Business. So we'd like to also, special thanks to Dean, uh, Dean Henninger um, for, and Representative Greg Smith for bringing all this together, it's fantastic. And uh, my name is Scott McConnell, Associate Professor of Economics here at EOU, and uh, I'll be kind of managing the proceedings. So if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone. We do have to ask the questions into the microphone because we do have an audience online watching as well, okay? so. Um, so just don't just blurt out your question quick, wait for me to come over to you, okay? <laughs> All right, so Ian Galloway, Vice President, Regional Executive of the Portland Branch of the Federal Reserve. 
uh, Bank of San Francisco. Uh, he's been with the Federal Reserve since 2007, and he's working with uh, low and moderate income communities, trying to advance the bank's commitment to supporting a healthy and sustainable economy. So with that, I'll let him kind of kick off and introduce uh, kind of what he does and how he connects something as big as the Federal Reserve to little local economies like ours. Yeah, thank, thank you, Professor McConnell. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for taking the time today to, to come out. Uh, it's a, a privilege to get to present to you all and hopefully give you a little insight into the Federal Reserve and how we do our work. Uh, so very grateful for that. I have had an action-packed day, uh, which I'm, again, so grateful for meeting with students and faculty uh, and administration here at the university. Um, and I've been looking forward to this opportunity to engage with you all uh, in this session as well. Um, so, uh, so most of my time at the Fed has been focused uh, uh, on low and moderate income communities. Uh, I used to be the Oregon uh, field manager uh, for uh, the San Francisco Fed uh, and largely meeting with nonprofits, uh, social sector organizations, uh, foundations, and others uh, to address challenges that are particularly impacting lower, low and moderate income communities and families. About a year ago, I changed jobs within the San Francisco Fed uh, and became the regional executive over our Portland branch. Um, and that means I lead our team there uh, in Portland, uh, as well as our business engagement uh, across the whole Portland branch uh, territory, which is all of Oregon, a little bit of Southwest Washington, uh, and the panhandle of Idaho. Uh, so my primary responsibility is to be embedded in the community meeting with business leaders and community leaders, acting as effectively a listening post uh, on regional economic trends uh, that I then surface to our monetary policymakers in San Francisco, and they factor that into uh, their decisions as it relates to interest rate adjustments and other monetary policy making. Uh, so that's uh, the kind of high level overview of, of what I do. Uh, at the Fed, I will say, just to put it in context, uh, we have uh, an amazing team of economists in San Francisco who are analyzing um, the quantitative data that we get uh, as part of our economic research function. Uh, and that uh, analysis uh, does a terrific job of telling us what is going on in our region uh, and, uh, to some degree, the trend lines associated with, with that activity, economic activity. Um, but what the data can never tell us is the why. You know, we can see that there is increased pressure uh, on supply chains. We can see that there's uh, uh, rising inflation. We can see that it's a tight labor market. Um, but until we talk to people participating in the real economy, we don't know why. And so part of my function, a big part of my function, is to sort of round out our assessment of what's going on uh, on the West Coast, which is the, the territory of the San Francisco Fed uh, Bank, uh, so that we can make a better informed decision uh, as it relates to monetary policy. So that's kind of the bigger context where my role fits into kind of a core uh, column of, of our work at the, at the San Francisco Fed. Okay, there we go, all right. <laughs> and so I, I can take questions from the online community too, I forgot to mention that. So um, is there any initial questions to start? We're gonna kinda keep this somewhat loose um, as far as just kind of a community question and answer period here. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for being here and uh, taking our questions. Uh, it's been, a very interesting couple of years, as I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, it was quite a few years back we succeeded in getting fast broadband here. Uh, a few of us organized ourselves, and we actually have broadband that is faster than most large cities. Uh, that's been interesting because, as you know, with the effort that was put forth to ensure that the economy would keep churning along as the pandemic came in, a lot of money got dumped into the environment and that has pushed into a lot of different places. Here it's coming to the housing market. 
and housing has become quite unaffordable here for people, even those who make a fairly decent living. Uh, I know it's not necessarily something that's in your purview, but I was wondering how the Federal Reserve might expect to deal with that. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, and actually, before I answer the housing question, um, I just want to underscore uh, the broadband uh, point that you made earlier. This is, this is a challenge that I hear uh, from rural communities across the, across the territory, but frankly, across the, the country, uh, is lack of access to high-speed internet. Uh, and that being a, a significant headwind to regional economic growth. Um, so um, it's very encouraging to hear that, that uh, we've solved for that here locally, but um, a lot of other communities are still figuring out a way to plug into all of those potential uh, opportunities that are enabled uh, through technology and, and online access. So it remains a significant headwind for, for a lot of folks. Uh, to the housing question, this is not unique to this part of the state. Uh, I have conversations with business leaders all over Oregon, uh, and you know it runs a gambit in terms of what we talk about. Uh, and it touches on all the things that you would expect, you know, supply chain issues and uh, inability to find workers and, and inflation and, and other uh, topics that are, I think, people would consider to be more central to the Fed's purview. Um, but housing always comes up uh, as a significant headwind and impediment to businesses' ability to both attract upwardly mobile families to their community because uh, there's no place to live. Uh, and, and keep their employees. Uh, you know, maybe they were in a starter home and they want to move up because their, their family expanded, but they can't because there's not enough housing supply to support that move. Uh, and that makes competing in that environment as an employer that much more difficult. Uh, so this comes up all the time. I don't have the tools to fix this at the Fed, um, but I can say that, that this is not unique to this part of the state. This is this pressure on, on housing and the supply and demand imbalance is uh, universally felt, uh, to, to and including in Portland. Uh, so this isn't just a rural uh, issue, it's an urban issue too. Uh, and it's fundamentally a, an imbalance between demand and supply and, and, and scaling up supply of housing takes time. Uh, and I know there's a, a number of initiatives that are out there, uh, you know, experimenting on, on different ways to build housing, to build it faster, build it cheaper, uh, that are promising, but uh, they're not going to happen overnight, and this problem is acute for a lot of people right now. Uh, so it's, again, something we hear a lot about just to validate that, uh, not in our purview specifically, um, but it's an economic issue. It's not just a uh, sort of nice-to-have quality of life issue. Uh, it is becoming a significant economic headwind for a lot of businesses across the state. Scott. Uh, thanks again, Ian, for coming out. Yep. Uh, I'm curious on uh, what types of information that you collect and summarize, uh, where you send it, and how do they use it? Yes, great question. Uh, so I, I sit down with a lot of folks all the time, uh, which is frankly um, why I love my job so much, because I get to meet so many interesting people and learn about so many different types of businesses and, and industries across the state. Uh, so typically, I'll have a conversation over lunch or a cup of coffee uh, or a Zoom call uh, and get to know uh, that person, uh, a little bit of insight into their particular business and industry. Uh, and then, you know, we have uh, some pretty fundamental questions about things like uh, the labor market and how, uh, you know, difficult it is to find new workers. And so I'd ask them about that. I'd ask them about inflationary pressures that they're, that they're experiencing. Uh, ask them, I mean, frankly, I ask them what keeps them up at night. Uh, because part of this uh, is to validate what we think we know and what we think we see in the data already. So getting confirmation from a bunch of folks who say, yes, you're seeing it right, this tracks with what we're seeing on the ground, there's value in that. But there's also value in hearing things that we haven't seen yet in the data uh, to kind of get us uh, you know, looking at that particular issue so that we can anticipate it and, and so we're not caught flat-footed if that becomes a major trend that impacts the, the economy in the future. Uh, so I always kind of ask uh, what you would consider to be kind of mainstream Fed questions, and then also just, hey, tell me what, what your, 
you're worried about right now, uh, or what particularly excites you about your industry that may have ripple you know, impacts across, across the sector uh, that could eventually, again, manifest as a, as a major economic trend that we should be paying closer attention to. So I have those conversations. I, uh, I essentially create a report, uh, and I feed that up into um, our uh, uh, economic research department uh, and to our president. And they factor those reports into their assessment uh, of what's going on in the district. And that ultimately shapes, helps shape uh, the decisions that are made uh, as it relates to what we do with interest rates and, and how we use our other monetary policy making tools. Uh, so it's a complement to the quantitative data analysis that we do in the normal course uh, within our economic research department. Um, but that context uh, and that ground truthing of what we're seeing uh, is incredibly valuable because, again, otherwise, you know, data are static, they're limited, and they're by nature backward looking. And so these conversations give us a little bit more insight into what people think is going to happen next uh, and help us understand the data uh, that we're seeing uh, in San Francisco as well. So I hope, hope that answers your question. And I'm happy to answer a follow up. If Thank you. I want to return briefly to the housing question. And first, a disclaimer. I'm a physicist by training, a lab rat looking out at the real world from that point of view. But uh, it seems to me, by looking at what I perceive the real world, is that housing crunch in part is used by the investing liquid capital into solid real, real, real estate, you know, as, as, as the safe investment that you can do. And if that, I'm not sure whether your data shows that. But if it does, is it possible that it might reverse and these housing houses may be sold for these investors who buy these properties to invest in more riskier ventures? So uh, this isn't going to surprise you. I can't speak to many of those questions. <laughs> uh, that's not, that's not uh, sort of the Fed's role. Uh, you know, we don't speculate on, uh, you know, the composition of the housing market, ownership in, in uh, within the housing market, and whether it's good or bad, or you know what those those shifts of capital mean um, the long term. Uh, so I can't speak to that specific question. Uh, we do look at it, uh, so we are aware that uh, you know there is uh, obviously uh, you know some investment, um, uh, some investor interest in the housing market, and we'll track that over time and and factor it into our decision making. But uh, I can't speak to to the to the specific question that you raised, um, and I. I um, so I apologize, but I'm happy to answer a different question or, uh, I mean, there's, th unfortunately, this is going to be something I'm going to have to refer to occasionally. Uh, so I'm, I'm neither an economist, uh, nor am I an actual monetary policy maker. Uh, I, I report to actual monetary policy makers and economists. Uh, so some of the more technical questions that you all have that fall into those camps, I'm going to have to, unfortunately, uh, refer to my uh, uh, colleagues at the San Francisco Fed, and I am genuinely happy to uh, ask these questions of them, and then report that back to you. Um, but in this role, I can't, I can't speak to it specifically. But I appreciate the question. Any other questions? Of course, Doug, I got way over there. It's gonna be a workout before. That's right. <laughs> In addition to raising interest rates, you mentioned other monetary tools that you use. Can you explain on that, explain those? Sure. Um, so our primary tool is, is the Fed funds rate. Uh, so when we talk about raising or lowering interest rates, that's, that's typically what we refer to. Um, and it is our primary tool. Um, and we want people to know that it's our primary tool so that we don't send mixed messages uh, when we uh, do act on monetary policy. Um, the other that's been in the news a little bit lately is our balance sheet. Uh, so our balance sheet is how we um, have managed liquidity in the financial system, um, beginning largely um, uh, around the, the Great Recession. Um, uh, we significantly increased our balance sheet at that time, and then we did again uh, during COVID. Um, you may have heard the term tapering. Uh, so tapering in that context it was the slow reduction in the amount of uh, 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 assets that we purchased. Uh, contributing to our, our balance sheet. Uh, that has now uh, ended entirely. 
Uh, and from what I understand and have been told, and, and I'm not sharing any trade secrets here, uh, uh, we're going to allow, unless the decision is made, to do something else. But for now, the, the current position is uh, those securities will eventually mature. Uh, and over time, our balance sheet will shrink accordingly. Um, and we really don't want it to be front and center as a monetary policy tool um, because we don't want to send mixed messages as it relates to the Fed funds rate. Um, so we want it to sort of re slowly shrink naturally in the background. Um, and then for the focus to really be more on the, uh, on the interest rate decision. But that's the other primary monetary policy making tool that we have. Okay. So speaking of interest rates, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we're in a, a, a time where we've had four to five years of kind of a suppressed inflated rate, inflation rate. Would there be any thought that the current uptick in inflation may be a built up, pent up uh, inflation that is, is going to subside as a, as a natural course of kind of capturing maybe some um, costs that business has not been able to capture the last four or five years? And so that you know, a, an, an inflation rate of 10% shouldn't scare us right now because it, it will be muted by the, the fact that it's, it's, it's just a reaction to the last three, four or five years of very low abilities to capture maybe costs in the industry. So again, not a non-monetary policy maker, so I can't get into the to the nuance of that question, but I do want to speak to this because it's 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 a very important question. Uh, you know, in, we have a dual mandate, as I suspect most folks know, uh, and that dual mandate is price stability and full employment. Uh, and right now, uh, we have a very tight labor market, so I think you could argue that we are fulfilling that side of our dual mandate of our mission. Uh, that we're at or, or above full employment, as close as we can get. Um, but price stability is uh, something that we um, need to be um, focused on um, in particular right now. We have inflation at a 40-year high. Um, uh, that's too high, it's uncomfortably high. Um, and we're committed to using all the tools that we have to address it. Um, this has been an unprecedented or very challenging last two years, uh, and there are a lot of things that contribute to inflation, um, uh, in a lot of which, you know, certainly, um, uh, you know, over the last year and a half or so, supply chain disruptions have been a big part of that. Um, I know that we did an analysis um, in October um, where I believe about 4% we had inflation of about 4, 4.2%, don't quote me on that specific number um, at that time. And we estimated that about three quarters of that was supply chain related uh, you know, and, and COVID related. And so, you know, as we emerge from COVID, as uh, those disruptions remain, uh, you know, we anticipate uh, some of those supply chain issues to, to remain as well. Um, so uh, long answer to your, to your question, uh, this is uh, something that we are laser focused on. We take very seriously. We will use all of our tools to address it. Um, but as Chair Powell has said uh, in his congressional te testimony, we will be nimble in our response and we will be humble um, because there's still a lot of uncertainty and things are changing every day and we wanna be measured and deliberate uh, in our response. But thank you for the question. Okay, anybody else right now? Other? Sure. Uh, right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, um, interest rates, mm -hmm. uh, four to five percent sounds terrible when compared to two or one and a half. But there was a day when four and five percent was an exceptional interest rate to get on loan. So you, it seemed like you've got upside to work with and but I guess on the other hand you don't want to drive up inflation uh, I mean you, you 
you'd want to drive down inflation if it's if it's just a manifestation of a, of a just so how how do you do that i mean is that that uh, and you probably just answered the question in what you just said but uh, you've got a little bit of room but you got to you as you said you got to be humble and nimble um, so does that that mean monthly increases or does it mean an increase and then wait so i think um this is the question of, of this particular moment, yeah. you know, when it comes to, to monetary policy. You've heard uh, folks may, maybe refer to a soft landing, um, you know, which is, you know, how do we transition out of this period of extraordinary economic uncertainty into something that's a little bit more sustainable and less variable. Um, and that's, in essence, what, what you're speaking to. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our leadership, uh, Chair Powell, uh, President Daley in San Francisco, have all gone on record uh, saying that they believe that there uh, will be interest rate increases this year. Uh, and, you know, of course, that decision won't be made until the FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee, which is the group that makes interest rate decisions, comes together and actually votes on it. Um, but right now, if you ask them, uh, they would tell you uh, that they anticipate rate increases. And uh, what we don't know is, is how many uh, and how much. And that's a decision for the policymakers that I can't speak to. Um, but I do believe it is the challenge, as central bankers, is the challenge of this moment, uh, is how to navigate um, this uncertainty in an inflationary environment uh, effectively and actually, you know, um, put together a glide path that gets us to uh, that, s that soft landing. Yeah, I think uh, Cody, one of our students, had a good question this morning because the interest rates going up has kind of a double-edged sword, right? It does depress demand, but it also increases costs on the cost mm -hmm. side. And so, did you want to talk to the balance sheet, sheet side of that a little bit, or you want to leave that alone? <laughs> okay. So, uh, this is conjectural, but um, it became fairly obvious to me that uh, the global supply chains and the reliance on just-in-time delivery left a lot of the cupboard short um, and that that may in fact be driving some of the um, shortages that have then resulted in price pressure and inflation. Uh, what's your feeling about that? Supply chain policy is, is not our, uh, I know. Uh, it's <laughs> I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna do justice to, to these questions uh, without also uh, running afoul of, of the fact that, and, and, and this is, and I'm not just saying this, uh, you know, here in the moment, uh, you know, the Fed has a, uh, you know, very defined role. And, you know, uh, there's a lot in the world that impacts uh, the macro economy that we need to be cognizant of and react to. Uh, but that doesn't make us subject matter experts in those things, and it certainly doesn't make us um, uh, rule writers or, or regulatory uh, agencies or, or fiscal agents uh, to actually make those changes or, or uh, set that policy. So uh, sometimes it feels like the Fed, because we touch so much of the economy, uh, is the go-to place for, for everything relating to the economy. Um, but the truth is, 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 you know, our primary job uh, is to uh, track trends, understand the data, understand what's going on to the best of our ability, and then make monetary policy to the best of our ability uh, to put us on a sustainable, healthy economic growth trajectory. Uh, so uh, I can't speak to the global supply chain issues. I, this is something that we, we hear from our business uh, leaders a lot, uh, that they have had to pivot substantially uh, to react to the fact that uh, you don't have the just-in-time delivery option. Uh, and we are seeing some folks, uh, you know, uh, hoarding inventory for example, um, and, uh, you know, uh, using uh, their purchasing power to uh, protect themselves against some of uh, those potential risks. Um, so aware of it, they're certainly experiencing it. Um, I can't speak to whether it's good or bad or, or what our official policy as a country should be as it relates to the global supply chain in my role.
um, <clears throat> with, uh, with COVID putting so many small businesses out of business, are there any programs that you know of to help someone trying to start up post COVID? That's a good question. I think the SBDCs are actually very good uh, partners um, when it comes to small business uh, development uh, and a good one-stop shop. Uh, if you are starting a new business and don't know where to go, I encourage you to, to look up your local SBDC. Uh, and that stands for Small Business Development Center. Uh, and they're scattered around the state uh, and they can provide technical assistance. They can send you to a lender. Uh, they can help you navigate the uh, local building codes and regulatory environment. Uh, so it's a good place to start uh, if you're uh, starting a new business. Uh, and then if you're at the point where you need uh, to uh, grow your business, uh, then uh, you know, I'd encourage you to, to reach out to your local community bank or credit union um, and see if they have any programs uh, for uh, small business owners uh, because they often do uh, that are not always well known and well advertised. So uh, I encourage you to, to call them and ask. Um, but there are a lot of resources out there uh, that, uh, that an SBDC can, can certainly steer you toward. Another chat one, uh, could the house price challenge be related to regulations like zoning? Again, I can't speak to uh, the housing market specifically. Um, I think you can um, make the observation that, that anything that, uh, and this isn't just true of zoning, it's, it's true of construction costs, it's true of uh, availability of labor, uh, contractors, uh, materials, uh, anything that, that makes those things more difficult or more expensive um, can slow the production process. Uh, and so uh, in the context of zoning, uh, you know, I, I would encourage whoever asked that question to work with their local city or county uh, to understand those, those rules better um, and uh, to the best of their ability work within them. Um, but I, again, can't speak to, to whether zoning is, is net good or bad for the housing industry uh, and would defer that to an expert who can. Um, so you mentioned that the Fed is really interested in tracking trends and understanding the data, or trying to make sense of some of the data. And I was just curious um, from what you know Currently, are there any trends that are particularly interesting at this time or that might be important specifically in rural Oregon? There are a number of trends. Uh, let me speak to one, and, and this, is, this is just Ian <laughs> sharing what, what Ian thinks is interesting uh, and not necessarily speaking for, for the Fed as a whole. Um, but I am fascinated by the uh, adoption of technology um, uh, in this region, uh, and I have heard of um, farmers who uh, are now able to essentially uh, run their whole farm off an iPad. Uh, I was actually at a baby shower on, on Saturday, uh, and I got to talking to, to a farmer at the baby shower, and he pulled out his smartphone, and he uh, was showing me uh, his irrigation system and how he could, with the push of a button, uh, start a cycle. Uh, and you know the fact that we're moving towards this wide adoption of technology uh, in agriculture um, is fascinating to me, and I think it has implications for the industry as a whole, long term, which are which are interesting. It has implications for the workforce and the kind of training uh, that the next generation of farmers is going to need to be successful uh, in that future agriculture ag agricultural uh, uh, world. Uh, as well as just the ability of, of farmers and, and others in ag to um, sort of leverage innovation and technology and automation and, and science. And, uh, you know, I, I was talking to somebody on Friday um, about work that he has done in a lab identifying uh, plant-based viruses. And they can now do this analysis so quickly that they can identify the emergence of a new plant-based virus in a crop before it becomes a problem and takes out uh, the entire uh, harvest. Uh, so innovations like that I find to be fascinating. It's, it, again, just speaking for myself here, 
seems to portend a larger shift in the industry uh, that I think will have wide ranging impacts across a lot of different domains. Yeah, just a quick comment. I have another business case for you mm -hmm. <laughs> about that. Uh, I was uh, on the board of the Grand Round Model Watershed for quite a few years and still am as an alternate, but um, I sort of hounded the organization for years about uh, monitoring if you're going to throw money at things and maybe you should figure out if they're working. And we got ourselves a monitoring coordinator. More than that, we got ourselves some drones. So if you're trying to figure out what happens upstream and you can't get there because it's wilderness or whatever, the answer is pretty straightforward. You can just fly one of these things over, do some infrared sampling, do all kinds of stuff, and it works. Yep. So, And can I just say, just to follow up on that point, uh, why these types of insights are, are so valuable to us? Uh, not only is that changing the way that, that people do their work um, in the fields and forests, uh, it's also creating a whole new local industry. Uh, you've got a lot of drone manufacturers now uh, setting up shop uh, in, uh, in Oregon and, and southern Washington, uh, which are creating jobs and economic activity. And so you have this uh, sort of kind of cluster effect uh, as more of those drones are needed in the field. Uh, there's more demand for uh, local sourcing of, of that technology, and you see all sorts of new businesses cropping up. Uh, to support that. So um, that's precisely the kind of insight that, that is very interesting to us because it affects a lot of different things. Yeah, this question is related to that. Um, the, as the rural environment goes through this economic shift from being mostly a resource extractive base to, you know, not exactly sure <laughs> where, where things are going completely, um, does the Fed, this is a kind of a general question, I think I know the answer to, but, I'm, but I, I would like it clarified. Does the Fed really specify policy based like regionally or is it all kind of take the data and then a national policy? So it's, it's um, the latter. Yeah. Uh, so if we're talking specifically about monetary policy, uh, that, that, that is um, decided at, at a national level. But I will say that one of the features of the Federal Reserve System is we're a bit of a decentralized central bank, and that's for a good reason. Um, you know, this was an attempt to distribute uh, monetary policy-making power uh, across the country so that it wasn't concentrated in just one place. Uh, and the value in that is that uh, the information that we collect, uh, even though it may lead to a single decision that's going to impact everybody, um, is diverse, uh, profoundly diverse relative to what you would get if you didn't have this, this diversified, um, distributed uh, information gathering uh, system uh, that's, that's um, again, a feature of the Federal Reserve System and, and unique in the world. Uh, the Fed is, is unique for, for, for that element uh, and for our dual mandate. I believe this is true, um, uh, but last I checked, we were the only central bank in, in the world that has a dual mandate that has to balance uh, price stability with full employment. Uh, you know, virtually every other central bank is exclusively focused on price stability. Uh, so there are elements of the Fed that are unique, um, and one of those is this, uh, this sort of uh, distributed power model um, that I think does a nice job of servicing diverse opinions uh, that may get lost in the shuffle if um, that decision-making structure was headquartered in, in just one place. It seems like a lot of the information you gather would also be useful in shaping legislative policy. Is there any connection between the two, between Congress and the Fed? There is no connection. So the Fed is, is a, um, was created by Congress. Uh, so if Congress wants to uh, change our mission or how we do our work, uh, that's absolutely within their purview to do. Um, so in that sense, we're, we're connected. Um, but we really are an independent monetary policy making um, institution. Uh, and so we don't um, collaborate on legislation or propose legislation. Um, and uh, you know that really is, is the purview of, of Congress, fiscal agents, elected officials, and others. Um, and we are 
sort of you know, laser focused on executing monetary policy um, uh, despite what's happening uh, uh, in terms of policy. We respond to policy. We don't advocate or propose policy. Um, this is maybe kind of a follow-up to my first question a little bit. So we spoke on a trend that was fairly positive. I was wondering if there's, even if it's just speaking as Ian, if there was um, some trends that may seem particularly threatening or something to keep an eye on, <laughs> and then again, specifically in rural areas. That's a great question. We've already talked about housing. Housing uh, you know, is something that comes up a lot. Um, and uh, it, is, it is a headwind for, for economic growth. Um, I also think, uh, and, th and this is more of an opportunity than a challenge, um, I think we just have uh, some really, really great uh, educational uh, institutions in the state, like Eastern, uh, but we have trade schools, we've got community colleges, of course we've got you know, UVO, OSU, uh, and a number of other um, great schools around the state. Um, I would love to see um, even more collaboration um, between employers and, and, and those institutions uh, so that we can make sure that we're preparing the next generation of workers to, to thrive right out of the gate. Uh, and so that's, that's where I would see kind of a, uh, a great opportunity to, to make a pretty big difference. Uh, and we've got a great uh, uh, system in place to provide that, and it's just probably largely a, a coordination challenge. Um, so that's what I would love to see uh, going forward. This question's uh, kind of for the theorists. So you mentioned in the last few years it's been unprecedented with all the COVID stimulus and, and the demands on the, the monetary supply have been unprecedented as well. Uh, have any part of the theory been disproved or we got to throw that out? You know, any Hubble telescope equivalent insights into what you guys rely on and what you guys teach and uh, what your research proves? Just, you know, what came out of this giant experiment, so to speak? So I think it's a great question. And, and maybe I would reframe it as a call to action uh, for us. Uh, you know, we're still very much in, uh, you know, response mode. Uh, you know, we're not back to where we need to be um, on a bunch of fronts. Um, there will be a time, I think, to do that uh, retrospection uh, and analysis. And we did something similar, actually, um, uh, in the wake of, of the, the financial crisis, uh, and we looked at a lot of the tools that we had going into that crisis and how we needed to adapt those tools to be more um, uh, uh, suitable in the future. And I can say that, and it's too, sur it's too soon to do a full analysis, but I can say that a lot of the tools that we deployed um, early in COVID and in, in 2020 um, were not available uh, 10 years before. Uh, and that reflects institutional learning, uh, that we needed to be more responsive, more um, you know, uh, able to um, sort of meet the, the needs of the moment uh, than we were the last time around. Um, so we will absolutely do that, that analysis, and it's crucial, and it does lead to material uh, changes to how we do the work, how we look at the data, and the tools that we have available to us to, to execute uh, on our mission. So um, to be continued, but absolutely great question, and, and it is something that we will, we will prioritize once we get sort of fully past this and back to a more normal uh, trajectory. I will. <laughs> People often focus on tech solutions to current economic challenges. How significant do you think social relationship skills are in solving the systems level challenges that are needed and why? Interesting question. Well, we were just, it's funny, we were, we were just uh, uh, talking about a, a similar question at lunch uh, in the context of um, 
what work is going to look like, the future of work, uh, and what people's expectations are going to be uh, in terms of hybrid, uh, full virtual, fully back in person, some, some combination of, of all those things. Uh, and we don't quite know yet. Uh, and it's going to look different at different businesses and, and, and in different industries. Uh, and uh, one of the things that came up in our discussion is that some of the skills uh, that, that traditionally uh, you have, have needed to uh, thrive in an office, in-person environment, um, maybe those skills are a little different than the skills you need to thrive in a virtual uh, hybrid or Zoom environment. Uh, and I, I have no opinion about which is better or worse, um, but I think the question is interesting because it speaks to a, a larger trend. Uh, and I don't know that anybody knows where we're going to land in terms of uh, this, this mix of in-person and remote work. Um, but when we do land uh, at some kind of equilibrium that holds, uh, that's going to create new opportunities and require new skill sets uh, for, uh, for people depending upon the role that they're filling. So interesting question, and, and I guess this is another to be continued uh, that, that we'll certainly pay attention to. Cedric's winning, so somebody else has to catch up here. Um, yeah, this this may have been answered in a way in one of the previous questions, but you did mention, so you said we're not back to where we need to be on a bunch of fronts regarding getting into the post-COVID era. And I was just kind of wondering um, if you could speak to what are some of the things the Fed has done. First off, where are we trying to get to? What are some of those fronts? Mm -hmm. And what is the Fed doing currently in response to try to get to where we need to be? Well, again, within the context of, of the Fed's role and the tools we have available to us, um, you know, for me, it always comes back to the dual mandate. And you know, we have a very, very tight labor market, uh, and and we clearly have work to do on price stability. Uh, so that's going to be our focus. And so I want to, um, you know, I I think we all would like that to be resolved before we consider, uh, you know, having having moved on to the next phase. Uh, so that, that would be my focus. Uh, you know, I think uh, in terms of general economic uncertainty, uh, the supply chain issues uh, are persistent in, in some ways. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of businesses would like those to be resolved uh, sooner than later as well. Um, but when I look at, at sort of the general uncertainty of the overall macro economy, uh, those are the two areas where I feel like um, we're, not, we're not quite where we want to be. But we don't, we at the Fed don't necessarily control, uh, we certainly don't control supply chain issues. Uh, so it's just, yeah, uncertainty. So with the um, increasing trend in like technology and automated machinery, is there like a foreseeable downfall in manual labor? I mean, we talk about and again, I'm not an economist, um, but uh, you know the the uh, mechanization and automation of, of some tasks. Uh, you know, there's a substitution effect essentially. Um, if I'm using that term correctly, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, with with manual labor, um, and you know that's that is a trend we'll track. Uh, I have heard anecdotally from um, from business owners uh, that. Um, even if there is some turnover in certain types of jobs as a result of technological in, in, uh, investment and automation, there are often new jobs that are created to either build that technology or maintain that technology or operate that te technology. Um, and you have workers sort of shifting to those new opportunities as they arise. Uh, so it's not always, I guess, the way I would put this, uh, again, as, as a non-economist is, it's not always a trade-off uh, that when you get more automation, you get less labor utilization. Uh, it can often mean labor utilization in a different way um, that is responding to that technological shift. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is an old problem. David Ricardo talked about this in 1804, mm -hmm. so it's been around for a while. Um, but as we've been educating, um, our, our population to keep up with some of this stuff. Um, 
debt has become an issue, student debt. Is this is the student the student debt load that is enormous right now and growing? Is this on the Fed's radar as far as policy? Is that something you guys touch on it or do you discuss at all? I'm just curious. So we don't touch on it from a policy standpoint. Um, we do track uh, student loan borrowing as well as other uh, types of, of consumer finance. Um, and so it's certainly something we're aware of, um, but it's, it's outside of the scope of, of what the Fed can affect directly. Okay. Other questions? Uh-oh, we run out of questions. Okay, excellent. So um, we are kind of at that time, so let's thank Ian for his time. Thanks. Thank you for the questions. Really interesting questions. And we do have refreshments in the hallway, so um, Ian will be sticking around for a little while if yep. you'd like to meet him and, and chat a little bit. Um, thanks for everyone for coming, and uh, see you down the road. Great. Thanks. That was great. Yeah, that's good questions.